So we are live, everyone, just so that you know. Um, welcome, everybody. This is the Skyro Town Council's workshop. Um, it is on Running Hill Road, and more specifically, it is on in infrastructure development uh, to support Running Hill Road and uh, the development. And I do, just as a prelude before I turn it over to the manager, having been here for as long as I have, is that this issue of bringing water and septic across the uh, main turnpike into that area has been part of the comprehensive plan for nearly 20 years, at least, that I can recall. So uh, it's a nice timing uh, for us to begin this project. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom and staff. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I should mention at the top of the show that uh, calling this Running Hill Road may be a bit of a misnomer that general, that area of town has generally been referred to as Running Hill. In fact, the zoning that has been changed fairly recently in the last, well, during my tenure in the year, uh, bears the name Running Hill. So, uh, but keep in mind the area actually uh, includes not just golf, it's kind of the area north of 95, including the golf course, up and over the hill. So it's a fair amount of property. Um, I remember this uh, rezoning quite well because the first meeting I attended uh, upon taking the job was the second and final reading of the zone change. And judging from the capacity crowd in the room, it was, I wouldn't say controversial, but there, were a lot of, there was a lot of interest, a lot of involvement. I think it was uh, a lengthy process. Uh, but all of that uh, is rooted in the comprehensive plan. Um, and so the zone, zoning was changed in 2008, and essentially it adopted uh, a mixed use sort of development, all of which is predicated on public sewer. And so consequently, in the intervening years, uh, we've not seen anything, although there have been a number of projects talked about. So Mr. Grondon is here tonight. He has uh, about 90 acres in his uh, ownership. Yes, and so I mean, that I own. And another 40 at the top of Running Hill Road that I just purchased. Oh, you did? Good. Uh, so Mr. Grondon is uh, really the majority landowner there and has land um, that comes all the way down to Gorham Road. And staff has been in, uh, working with him and his consultants for a number of years, and frankly, uh, he's been extremely patient, and we wanted to bring the matter to the council this evening. Um, there's a fair amount of history that uh, we're pleased to kind of walk you through. Um, and we'd also like to give uh, Ken and his consultant an opportunity to talk about his development plans. And the real key that uh, question that, that is before us is, um, <coughs> What, so what level of public involvement, if any, does the town have in sewer extension? Uh, and how might we forge this private public partnership? And I should mention um, the public sewer component in prior council in fiscal year 2010 through its CIP budget did approve $1.45 million for sewer extension uh, with the caveat that we would not do that until there was a sufficient project to justify that sort of expense. And that, so that's kind of the threshold question that, that confronts us right now. So that's really a, a quick overview of what brings us together. Uh, Karen, do you have anything else to fill in by way of Sure, I can, I can fill in quite a bit about it. Actually, it's been a while. Um, we, I've owned the land personally for about two years. My, my former company, RJ Grondon, and I owned it uh, for about almost 10 years before that. Um, when I left the company, that I, I took that piece of land with me, and you know I was really looking forward to developing it. I had been project manager on the earlier work done there, was real familiar with the project, and and uh, the the, um, the potential um, problems to solve, the wetlands and vernal pools and things like that. That that I, I did for a living when I worked at for London. Uh, I was project manager of the Larrabee Wetlands Complex and, and, and really enjoyed working in that type of field and recognized potential and the beauty of this piece of property. And so, you know, I've been going through this, the early planning stages and got quite a lot done with Army Corps and DOT, uh, MDEP, and Steve's got a lot done with that as well. Um, my project that I'm proposing is uh, phase one is a is, a, is a, um, 11 duplexes on on the first phase that are directly across from none such golf. And um, they're, they're higher end duplexes that really nice finishes and things like that. They're going to start at the 312 
thousand dollar range and it's basically a 55 and over community that I think is, is a nice fit for the area with the golf courses and all the amenities around. Um, it's also a good thing I think for the town for the most part as far as the tax burden, burden being considerably less with schools and things like that. Um, the sewer though is, is one thing that's really been a, a stickler over the past 10 years or so with our property as well as the adjacent property that I'd recently acquired. The owners in, of that project and I were really close and I basically would show the land to developers and, and builders and commercial users and they all they love the visibility that it's a beautiful land on top of the hill but it always comes down to sewer. They they, you know, they just say we can't wait. You know, most of those people want to be in the ground in <coughs> six months or something, and and you know they they hate to wait for sewer. Uh, my project that I'm starting is, I think, good because I can phase in sewer. And ju I just want to clarify one comment too. It's sewer only is coming across the, the under the turnpike. There's a 16-inch ductile water main in Running Hill Road. And uh, and eight or twelve, um, twelve and Gorham Road. So, you know, I can phase my sewer in as I need it, but in order to to provide some kind of a catalyst to the upper Running Hill Road property, it's almost that sewer needs to be done sooner toward that area to service that area, which is roughly four thousand feet or something like that, further up the hill. So all I need to do for my project is to phase it and, you know, I'll bring the sewer up the hill with the additional phases as I go. But in that four-year um, phase, phase time, you know, there could be people that come and go, that commercial users that are very valuable. We had one a few months ago that they went, but, you know, they still, they still might build something. They're still very interested in the property. Um, so I think it's important to, to serve that upper area with sewer fairly soon. Yeah, and just to put some uh, finer numbers to it, the, the town did commission a study uh, to look at a number of routes, uh, possible routes to get sewer under 95 and how <coughs> best, you know, where to bring it over, which cheapest and so on and so forth. Uh, and Ken Grodman has been integral in those conversations. We have identified a preferred <coughs> alignment, if you will, um, and the cost associated with, with simply getting it on the other side of the turnpike is about $2.8 million. Do we have those documents? Yeah, this is provided in the agenda packet. Yeah, we've got another one. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can distribute some more now. So. I'm not in the real estate bargain, but it's 312000 affordable for a senior? It, uh, it could be. It depends yeah. on the household. Market rate. It's not, it's not intended to be affordable, but it's... it's well, not asking because that's, that's what the need is in Sparrow, so I, I'm just asking. I, I don't know, you know, what... I don't, I don't know where it falls on that line, so I'm just curious. I mm -hmm. just want to know because I know we're going to get questions about it, so... I don't think we can answer that definitively. It's, it's, it's not intended to be an affordable uh, project, and, and I suspect that's going to be probably at the upper limit of affordability, is my hunch. Can you tell us what the history of public versus private uh, installa payment and installation of sewer in the town of Scarborough has been? I'm not aware of any other any public private partnership. Uh, I don't mean partnership. I mean who, who pays for the sewer that runs out to uh, Higgins Beach or Pine Point? Who paid for it? Thank you, sir. Well, right. actually, private private money, private development has, and the and the infrastructure is then in turn turned over to the district to own and manage and maintain over time. So it's private money that has essentially built out, but for Hygis Parkway. That was the one area where the town 12, 15 years ago decided to go ahead and install not just sewer, but all sorts of other infrastructure to ready that area for development. And 
in an effort to recoup our investment, we do have a district fifth district in place, and there are sewer assessments assigned to those properties. But, but generally speaking, the sanitary district says right. yes to the project, and then there is a funding mechanism between um, their funds that they already have, maybe to get it started, as well as TIF money, as well as um, fees, as well as then increases in any type of sewage. Right. Yeah, I guess so I'm, there, I'm, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering why why would we be looking at town funding if it's a sewer district project? Well, I, I guess I, I'm not aware that the sewer district ever puts <coughs> public right. their monies into a deal. Yeah. Their their general policy is that. Uh, private development pays for uh, that extension, you know, um, and it's usually done as part of uh, the site plan approval and other types okay. of things they're paying for there. So what's uh, different here? The, I think the thing that's, that's different here is that um, we always look at um, where there may be some extraordinary costs that perhaps there is a public benefit to helping out um, you know, to extend something like sewer service, which is extremely um, expensive as we're going under the turnpike. So I can't speak to the discussions in 2010, but I believe what was thought of is, okay, well, if the town can finance or, or pay for um, just bringing the sewer to west of the turnpike, um, then that would prime the pump, if you will, for other development to happen. And so one developer or a series of developers didn't um, really wind up paying what are essentially some pretty hefty costs. One, one quick comment <coughs> that I think will kind of get your attention or realize that it's really worthwhile considering this sewer extension is our project on the 89 acre parcel only the projections of total build out is over seventy million dollars and, and it's a fifty five and over plus mixed use. So, you know, low burden on town services and things like that. But not only that, we we hit that big service area at the top of the hill. There's sixty to a hundred acres of more commercial land at the top of Running Hill that when sewer is provided to that area that will provide a catalyst for commercial growth. So I, I have two co primary concerns. Okay, the first one is there, if there's a connector that goes through there, that was one of the issues we talked about was the fact that there's some open land right there and that could be the prime route for any future, it's an option, let's put it that way. Um, we, the, one of the discussions was if there's a lot of development back there, are we gonna end up driving the cost of this project, the, the, the potential cost of a, um, uh, a highway extension because now we've got to displace commercial entities or other developments there. So I, I would like to look uh, at and see what those options are. I know we don't have routes yet. We don't have any of that information. I, I'm fully aware of that. Um, I, I've also heard uh, the proposal of coming in from the Gorham side and let development kind of come south that way and feed down through, through that direction. So I'd really want to see, I'd, I'd be curious to know what, what the cost would be to run this under the turnpike and is there a way we could work with them as they redo the exit 45, is it the main mall one, I think, that they're talking about six or whatever it is? Uh, could, we, could we find a way to piggyback with that project, let's say, if that's a more viable alternative? So I, I know there's a lot there, sorry. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think there's some um, incredible, um, uh, relationship between trying to open up this area and uh, the potential turnpike spur. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Grandin, we've, we've certainly been working toward um, uh, a, a particular uh, investment, a, a company that's been looking to locate for a while, and it's one of the things that we were trying to attract them with. We're saying, you've got the Running Hill Road area, and you've got this potential turnpike spur that depending on you know, where it happens, it could very much benefit um, some properties along this area. So it's absolutely um, relative, it's, it's, it's definitely relevant to um, this discussion. Um, again, I think it can spur a lot of uh, potential development as well. Um, See, we got the... Coming from Gorm, the Gorm coming side. Coming from Gorm. So coming up from, that's really what we're talking about, is coming under the turnpike um, toward, at the lower part of his property. So
So that's where the 2.8 million is coming from, going under the, the highway there. And then we're really, there's another $600,000 that would go from the turnpike to really Gorm, Gorm Road and to the front of his property. And then, you know, this is, the, this is a, another crucial point of, um, in order to open up the top part of this land, the Running Hill Road area, um, we definitely need that connection that goes through Mr. Grondon's property. And that is another million. Million, million 1.4, something in there. Um, so that, you know, it's, it is a pretty hefty, hefty um, um, uh, lift with respect to um, this, this piece. The other thing I want to just mention is um, we certainly looked at you know, is a TIF the right mechanism for doing this? And I, um, we do have to say at this point, a TIF it has to have a commercial component. So that financing technique is not really available to us um, at this point. I think um, it might be helpful if um, you perhaps could walk them through what this project could look like because they've been trying to evaluate whether or not there's a piece. But I know think Peter was... If, we want to get to a question for Peter. And, and, and I guess that was, that was kind of the question. So the number that you have at the very end of that paragraph is $4.5 million to do this. That's right. And to get I, it all the way through. Yeah, and I keep coming back. If we haven't done this for any other development in Scarborough, why would this be, why would we set precedent to do it this time? And the second problem that I have, or not problem or concern, sure. is as we take a look at the 50, 40 or $50 million we've got earmarked already for municipal investments, mm -hmm public safety building being number one, the libraries being queued up, you know, monies, and, and right. we're getting a lot of pushback this year by the level of debt the town has. I, I, I need to be convinced, sure. a compelling business case, why this is, because mm -hmm. it sounds like you want this done soon, and so we've got a lot of competing needs for the capital right. that we have. Absolutely. Five million dollars, four and a half million dollars, mm -hmm. and there's always going to be creep. Right. You know, I, I just, for something we haven't done before, and what's going to happen to the next lot of land that wants to be developed? Mm -hmm. I, I have some real concerns about why this it gets to your point, Chris. Right. Why is this so different? Right. And that's a serious chunk of change. My tax revenue that comes in per year alone will pay $1.1 million, maybe almost $1.2 million. Not per off year. 11 units alone. Pardon? Not off 11 units in phase one. When I'm total built out. I'm right. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's down so, wide, so. Yeah. Short term. term. We have a short term yeah. financial management issue we've got to deal with. We've got and, and I think right, and I think that's why we're particularly sensitive because we know that we did the investment in Highgas Parkway and that's back to what's the what's the trigger, what's the threshold that we would need in order to um, even invest the one point four million that was set aside in the CIP. Just to go final point, just anyway, on, on this point, um, you know, we're here before you're not necessarily advocating for this. We, I think when Karen and I came to the town, these sorts of decisions had been made in terms of through the comprehensive plan, uh, the, the the zoning that was put in place very clearly requires public sewer, and the fact that a prior council uh, threw some money at this, not enough apparently, I think is a uh, indication or a recognition that there is a bit of a unique situation, and in my mind, that unique situation is getting it on the other side of the turnpike. Where it goes from there, who pays for it, I think is a, is a parallel conversation, but a different one. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the but-for issue. Uh, we, this land would develop, it, would develop, but for the fact that sewer doesn't exist on that side of the turnpike. Uh, I, I, so, if I can ask a question. So, have we looked at, I mean, this is if we went under the turnpike and went across. But have we looked at coming down from South Portland? I mean, you're at Spring Street. It's got to have sewer to come down from. There are options from West Portland and uh, South Portland. Apparently, those are more expensive. There's, there's ledge issues and, and distance. And, and, uh, so, perhaps it would be helpful to look at the yeah. So just an overview of the project. Quickly. I think it would help the council have a better idea of what the area we're talking mm -hmm. talking about. My name is Steve Harding. I work with Tobago Tennis. I've been working with Ken for a couple of years now on this project that Ken's calling uh, Oak, uh, Oak Ledge at Running Hill. Um, just to get you oriented, uh, sure. 
bikes on top. Thank you. This is uh, this is the turnpike here. We have the spur going over to 295. Running Hill would be up here. Gorm Road is down here. Ken's 89 acre parcel, which is the one we've been looking at developing, is right here. And then there's an adjoining 40 acre par parcel here that connects to Running Hill Road. Um, next slide kind of depicts what we've shown for development. I'm oh, sorry. Can I interrupt for just can you go back to the Can you go back to the slide? So, I mean, it seems like, I mean, that's target right there. There's got to be a sewer there. It looks like your mushrooms yeah. are coming just down from the north as you go up. This is, uh, this is uh, Sam's Club. Uh, if you go up to the intersection of Running Hill and coming, right there? Yeah. Yeah, so coming down to the red parcel there, I mean, that's... In my understanding of talking to Dan Baker, the previous planner, there was study or there were analysis done of bringing the sewer that way and either ending up in Westbrook or, or South Portland, I'm not sure, I believe it was Westbrook, but there were some prohibitive um, cost factors in there. Either the capacity of the plant or, or getting there was a problem. So I, I don't know the history of that, but I know that the past pledge. conversations Dan has mentioned the issue of legend. that was, uh, wasn't a feasible alternative or, or was a more costly alternative. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Anybody else has any questions along the way? Certainly interject. Um, this is the, the plan that, that uh, Ken has for the 89 acre development. Forum Road is right here. This is run, uh, Red Brook. And up here is Running Hill. The green and the brown represent the 89 acre parcel. That Ken has. This is the Running Hill parcel. We actually brought this through to the planning board in a master plan concept under the plan unit development uh, approach, which encourages dense developments. Uh, we were told that we needed to secure this area here as to make sure that we had the connection to running hill for traffic, and in this case, sewer would be a, a key component of that. Uh, we also needed to do a little bit more uh, regulatory work with fertile pools and wells. Sure. Where do you stand right now in your permitting? Um, we have done uh, all the uh, wetlands mapping and vernal pool mapping. We have some vernal pools here. Uh, we have talked to the DEP. This first phase, which is 22, uh, du uh, excuse me, 11 du duplexes for 22 units, we wouldn't need uh, any Army Corps permit because we wouldn't be affecting any wetlands. There's a pump station here, which would be end up being a sanitary district one. What's that work that's running through the front? Sorry. It looks like you've got a that little brook or river red there. Brook is red brook. That's red brook. Correct. Isn't yeah, that so one is that one of our preserved watersheds? So there are yeah. certain parameters we'll have to do and it will be there will be monies paid to a fund to develop it within that uh, and the DEP would look at that. So we've met with the DEP. We don't have any vernal pool issues with the DEP. We don't have any significant we have a significant vernal pool but it's further enough in the development, it's not a factor. So we, we feel very comfortable going forward. This would be a stormwater permit. The site would be a site law permit. We've met with the Army Corps. Uh, they have a little bit more jurisdiction on the vertical pools. We've met several times with Jay Clement with the Army Corps. We believe we have a plan that we have in place that would uh, be acceptable to him. So you know, we've, we've actually talked about coming forward to the planning board without the sewer, and it, it just didn't seem to make sense. We've got some. some Push back on call from the town not to not to do that because you know, we need to solve. So, right. so just, just to be clear, you, you, he could not um, do even the, the duplexes. And I check in with Jay just to make sure, um, just because of the density allowed and, and other things. We without sewer, he would not be able to so build. That's, that's what I'm, I guess my b a better question is: Is sewer the only thing that's left? Is that the only hurdle you have left on this project, or do you have other permitting issues that, that need to be addressed? Yeah, we would, we would at some point. Probably kick it into a traffic permit, so we'd have to address those issues, which is similar to any other large development. But there's no, there's nothing in this development that's a showstopper. Mm -hmm. so uh, one, one quick comment. That, no, you can't really read it, but the right half of that screen on the 89 acre parcel is mixed use, and and uh, it's residential is shown conceptually, but the There'll most likely be more commercial in that area. It's basically with with this kind of phasing, it allows us to change the um, commercial 
concentration and residential and have a mixed use area in the middle. Yeah, what Kevin's getting Go at ahead. is we've shown 237 units in this area. Uh, we could, you know, with this parcel here, there may be a potential for, you know, sharing some land there. Um, you know, as, as time goes on, it can talk to people. There may be, you know, uh, offices or some other commercial development that happens here. And, you know, this zone in the middle can be more of a mixed use where you have either a gym or a store or a restaurant or something that supports it. And, and that's, 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 the, that's the RH2 zone? Is that, I mean, that's this density. property is split between um, RH and RH2? And that density is allowed in that zone? Yes. Mm -hmm. And this parcel in yellow is really suited well for commercial. We had a, a, we just lost a really good commercial user that was interested in the, the right half of that, the entire 40 acre parcel and, and 25 acres of the 89 acre parcel that had moved to Portland. We were pretty far along with some negotiations on that one. And sewer was one of the things, the deciding factors. So did I hear you say that the, um, a master plan has been submitted to the planning board? Yeah, we have this approved, uh, I don't know if it has lapsed now, Jay, or? Uh, so the board, as I last call it, it's been a few years, um, did this. So our plan development review process has three steps. The first is sort of a site inventory step where you really look at the natural and uh, built environment and sort of identify areas for development. And the board worked their way through that. I believe we were working our way through master plan. I can't remember if the master plan was actually approved. I think, yeah, I think there was still pending the findings on the fertile pools and some other things. So that's really where it's at still with the board is the master plan process. And then once the master plan is approved, which generally conceptually shows the layout, then they dive more deeply into the subdivision site plan standards where they really drill into the traffic, stormwater, lighting, landscaping, all those real details. So it's, it's a, it's a multi-phase approach. So we're really, they've been through the first step and that's where it's uh, ended. It's been a few years at this point. So at what stage is the mixed-use commercial piece um, um, required or guaranteed or stated and accepted? That's, that, was one of the open that, 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 that was one of the open questions. Um, was really around, you know, understanding the, the mix of uses that are being proposed and how to control sort of the requirements of when those come in. So we, that, was a, that was still an open question, okay. frankly. You, you've now acquired the um, the other property that connects you to Running Hill Road. So, what are the plans? Are are you going to include this, you know, into the, the residential development piece? Are you holding that separate? Are you going to? I'm holding it separate. Uh, I, I prefer to use commercial because I, right. it's in the town's right. best interest to be able to capitalize on a TIF mm -hmm. if there's a certain concentration of commercial development. And I understand that, and I want to do what I can to promote commercial on that end of the project. And I think getting back to Jay's point, one of the open issues here, we had we didn't have this under control in the section of the roadway, which the planning board felt was key for the traffic and the, and the sewer. So that was one of the items that we needed to to nail down. So either to, um, to staff, um, as part of the plan. Um, do, does the plan um, do a full phase out estimated valuation and assign what is associated with residential versus what is associated with the commercial piece? Because to me it seems like the um, analysis is um, because the commercial component is what should drive the conversation around the infrastructure investment because it's required in order to do a TIF. So to me it's um, a correlation between the, well, Either one point. I, I've heard three numbers. I heard right. one point four. I've heard two point eight, and then four point five. So, whatever the number is to bring it across should be compared against what is the commercial value that this project is bringing to offset it. Correct. Well, at this point, the project shown is is residential only. Well, well, that's what Mr. Grund right. just said that there's the potential as market condi conditions change and the project builds out, it could go mixed use. But I understand your underlying point. How do we have the confidence up front? 
to do the financial right. modeling as to what the expected tax revenue I mean, is. Nothing gets so Mr. Brown, but so what if you get through this process and all of a sudden, you know what, I can't get anybody in here to come in as commercial, and 100% of it's residential, it's residential to me. Right. Just like Higgins. And other Higgins. Well, it, it, the other point is that density of residential requires two or two. He couldn't right. do that. Oh, I understand that. Yeah. Exactly. And, and just point of clarity about what the planning board does. The planning board has, you know, they, they review the ordinances, and yep. if the ordinance doesn't talk about sort of tax base and financial, right. you know, sort of that. Exactly. So I just want to be clear that when the planning board looks at this, they're just looking, do you have sewer capacity, yes or no? Yep. You know, the, the value question is really sits with you all. Right. Uh, with, with this density, I, I feel that commercial gets, gives more bang for the buck. With with the big, for instance, multi-office building, there's so many parking lots and things associated with that. That um, another good example, where my property is, there's a large area of wetlands and vernal pools. So that's roughly 40 acres, I think, or so that I'm not utilizing. So basically, I'm doing that kind of build out and bringing in upon final build out, to, like you brought up. One point two million dollars almost mm -hmm. on fifty acres. Well, the other people we were looking at with the forty acre users, they had a really, really large office building, and it was valued at potentially one hundred and fifty million dollars or something like that. So you know they were they were roughly twice as much, but they had big parking lots that ate up all of that property. So with a dense density that residential allows, it's, I feel that it makes more money for for the t town as far as tax revenues than but commercial. I, again, I struggle with it. I can maybe you can help me. I mean, I understand a prior council set some money aside. So let's that leave that off the table for a second. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's going to reserve someplace, Tom? No, it's just been, been budgeted. It's it's been budgeted. It it budgeted. Not been we've not bonded it. It doesn't, we've right. not moved forward at all. With no, okay. So, but just setting that aside, I, I'm still struggling with the compelling business case, why there's development all over Scarborough. We haven't paid for sewer to the prior conversations. This is a pretty heavy lift, as you suggested. Why are we making the case, or make the case for us, why this becomes a town responsibility to put the sewer in to enable the development? Mm -hmm. Why isn't it the developers? Mm -hmm. To cost to make why and my problem becomes if we do it here, the next mm -hmm. development that comes along, how do we have a clear way of saying we're not going to do sewer? I, I'm I really in a given where we are financially and the projects we've got on the table. Mm -hmm. I just I don't understand how this is different than other things. So that's I need that compelling okay. case. I think the policy decision was made in your complex. It was a recognition by the community, not by the landowners, that we wanted mixed-use development in this area. And what comes with that is that sewer is essential for that to happen. So I think it was uh, a bit of a policy recognition, uh, first and foremost. <coughs> I, I don't think the question is the policy. I think the question is who pays for the policy. Exactly. That's the real issue here. I, I don't think anybody's arguing that that's a, it's, it's, it's a positive thing to develop that area. The real question I think we're struggling with is, is it, what's an equitable way to fund that? And, and and how do we you know if it is a public private partnership and I'm not saying that we we don't look at those but we we, we need to Peter's point I think we need to have a pretty good business case for that. And uh, I was going to say oh go ahead. Oh, I was going to say well I agree with the points that are on the table. Um, in part, it's also hard for me. I mean, justifying this to the residents of this town while we're going through a really lean budget cycle and next year is going to be even harder budget putting getting this paid for and justifying it to me is going to be a difficult thing and yeah we need so we need a mixed use area but I can, I can tell you I'd be a lot more supportive of it if it was a project that I was going to be able to tell my the seniors in this town that they were going to be able to afford to move there that's a real need and it's so, it's hard, it, I'm sitting here thinking, I don't, we've got projects going on all over town. I don't know if I, if I need, we need this right now mm -hmm. for that investment. Nothing against you, sir. I mean, I, I think it, it would be a wonderful thing, but 
right now. I mean, we have to start living in the right now. What do we need right now? Um, everybody just seems to have a lot of I wants, and it's like, when do we put the stop and, and slow down and realize that I just, I don't know, I, I'm really bothered by the whole thing. Well, it's one of the reasons why we wanted to come today, because I think we've been um, trying to uh, articulate that. You know, at the most, we had 1.4 million budgeted, and as, as uh, Councilor Hayes pointed out, that doesn't even get us under the turnpike at that point, which was the original theory of making that, that investment, to take it so far and let um, the uh, uh, future development Take, it, take its course because we made that investment. But the reality is the 1.4 million doesn't do that. And so we have both um, a $1.4 million gap, if you will, just getting on the turnpike, not to mention <coughs> then another 600000 to get it to uh, Mr. Grondin's property, which is definitely we would have in a normal process he would be doing that. Um, and then it's that period of time, however long his development would take to build out to bring the sewer from Gorm Road up through Running Hill Road. And that part is also um, a, not a challenge, but it's a, certainly a question because that's where we really get a lot of bang for the buck is getting it up there. Um, but And that may be helpful at least talking about what your build-out scenario might be. Um, you know, I think you talked about a four or five year, and I'm just trying to want to it's check in. Now. Okay. Can you one, one thing, uh, I will, sure. Steve's look at a slide that can talk about the phasing too. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I think you've got to recognize, and, and every town, every location has, it, has its pluses and minuses. Uh, we've got an, a, a quarry in, in Wyndham that we're phasing out and doing an industrial park. One big negative thing is that it needs a traffic light, you know, and some like Saco is close to the highways and they, they've got their pluses that, you know, Saco sells good, it's close to the highway and, you know, we're far from the highway in Wyndham, that's a handicap. Just recognizing that, for instance, that traffic signal is, is one thing that a relatively short amount of money could be spent on to promote, to promote an economic development. And at, I've had this discussion with the state on, on this in the town, the town and I both, you know, if they could, if they were going to help one, the one town, you know, that's to, to recognize that handicap and help one town that needs economic growth, then those are the kind of things that people have to do. And to, if, if sewer isn't brought up to that point, you know, it's never going to be commercial. There's never going to be any significant growth up there. I've, I've done a lot of legwork in the last few years, and I've got easements from Bolus. You know, I've talked to the Turnpike. I've done a lot of legwork for this to provide the corridor for that, for this sewer extension. And coincidentally, Wooded and Kern's study that the town spent quite a deal of money on to look at the sewer, their, their uh, favorite option is the one that I chose from before, you know. So we, we were parallel thinking without even knowing it. You know, my, I, my, my course and theirs were one and the same when they did their long study. So I, I, I think my, my I don't, I don't, I'm not questioning the validity of the project, I'm not questioning the corridor, I'm not mm -hmm. questioning the need for it. My question is if this is going to come, is why now? I mean, you know, what, what is the motivating factor for us to do this this year, next year, the year after, versus allowing that build out to happen naturally um, whether it's through the, the, the new connector that's going in or natural growth coming in from the north or from the, 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 you know, from the South Portland side. I guess that would be my question is what, what's, the, what's the critical path right now that causes this to be the number one project for us and not allowing development just to kind of naturally pace itself up? I mean, the reason we're in front of you is that he's got a viable project. And he's got a project he's ready to move forward with now. That's what's written. But it's, 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 well, it's not viable if it is no sewer. Right. If it's zoned, if it's yeah. zoned uh, for a density that requires sewer, mm -hmm. then it's improperly zoned. Uh, and it's a chicken or the egg. Yeah. We're not going to get any z 
uh, activity out there right. if it doesn't have sewer. Right. So nothing's going to happen out right. there. There'll be little spots here and there, right. but they're all going to be based on yeah. septic systems sure. right. and large acreage space. So uh, none of which is going to move the needle for us economically. Sure. And single family residential will never move the needle for us uh, uh, in terms of uh, tax base. Right. And I understand. The, I mean, I understand from the developer standpoint of. Now is always the time, and I understand that completely. If, if you know, there's resources that need to go in, it has to happen now. But to case point, we've got development going all over Scarborough. You know, we've got stuff happening all over the place. And I guess I, I would, you know, in a situation like Hygis, it's twofold. I, I would not want us to be sitting in another position again, 10, 15 years from now, where we've invested in this infrastructure, like we rolled the dice with Hygis, and we're sitting here now with all this infrastructure debt on our on our plate and and no development to show for. And so, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, Tigus was, I think, an exception that we were looking at because we really needed that stimulus right then, right now, and we still haven't seen the full benefits of that yet. We're still hoping <laughs> that that's going to be the catalyst that we need to, to, to fully develop that area. So that's why I'm asking it. Why, why right now? It, you know, what, what is the motivating factor right now to make this investment? Is, is the, if, you know, if the property's going to sit there for 15 or 20 years and not move, um, I, I'm not sure that anybody can see that far out based on the new developments that we have with the potential spur going in and, and other development opportunities that aren't going to say that that area is going to naturally build out on its own anyway as the other development projects move forward, as the other infrastructure projects move forward. I, I don't know that. I mean, I, I don't expect anybody to really understand that. We, we looked at, you know, like I said earlier, over the last 10 years, we've seen so many big users come and go. The IDEX was one. They, yeah. they, we walked that land extensively. And then, you know, you get to talking about sewer and, you know, how quick can you be in the ground and they decided to stay put where they were. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's many other users that came and got and left because of sewer not being there. So, if, if it's, you know, it, in 2009, Scarborough Athletic Club, the people that owned the 40-acre parcel were going to build a significant um, athletic club with with um, tennis courts and gymnasiums and, and you know, it was a 50 to $75 million project which was would have been good on the top of the hill there and done well, served the community very nicely. But they left too. So I think in 2009 when they were here, that's when the, the um, talks about tour uh, came along with Scarborough Athletic Club. And, and I think if something like that were to come in as well, that might be a catalyst for us to say maybe that is Another viable reason to look at that area and put a little bit more emphasis behind it. I mean, I just and, and again, I, I'm not questioning the, the the design of your project or the validity of your project, but for more housing units, you know, uh, we're always looking for stock diversification, of course, and housing diversification. I don't think we're, you know, right now we've got a lot of stuff in the pipeline that we're still kind of waiting to see catch up. So, you know, I, that that's where I am on it. I, you know, I, it's it, it's it's a house versus not. I'm not questioning it's not a good project. I'm just saying. There's not, there's nothing really compelling or unique in this particular instance that tells me, you know what, this is really something that if we've got to push right now, other than the potential future outlook. You, you know what I'm saying? If it were, if it were something like, look, we've got a, we've got Scarborough Athletic in here, they're going to build a 50 million dollar facility privately, and they just need the sewer to come in. That might be something for us to really consider. I mean, I mean other towns are, are pretty progressive in economic development and promoting that and, and being. Forward <laughs> thinking to, to realize the handicaps that different areas of their town has. So, so, so I think that you're going to, you're going to. Why is it, but stuff. again, why is it? Hey, I mean, I'm sure you've run the pro models and other things. And, and if, if it's going to be 70 or 80 million dollar worth of build out, that can't be, the, the cost of the sewer can't be amortized mm -hmm. into your cost and amortized to your potential. I mean, why is it the town's responsibility to build the sewer? That's that's the piece that I'm... My use in. fits in the zone in, in the mixed-use area. I, I stopped in 2009 developing that property to, maybe it was 2006, um, when, when the mixed-use zone and it got rezoned to allow the town to, to do their thing. We lost a year of what we were going to be doing with this. Yeah, that, that doesn't really answer my question. I mean, are, are you I'm saying that? It, yeah. Are you saying that, that, that the cost, uh, unless the sewer gets built for you, that the project's not viable? 
when, when we were partnering with Scarborough Athletic <coughs> Club, the sewer discussion getting extended by the town to the, that site came up, and that's how it all came along. Does that answer your question? No. But no. they're not at the table no. anymore, right? Right. What was your question again? Is Ask the project again. viable? Why is, yeah. Why is the project can't, not viable? Can't you Did extend you the sewer to amortize it into the cost of your project? Of an $80 million project build out, it's, it's not that big of a number. I'm that providing that. every number is big. Well, <laughs> here, here's our reality, okay? I mean, where we are is if, if, if we haven't got it reserved, which is what I heard, we've had a, you know, next year we're looking at a really tough budget cycle. I mean, we're probably talking about really tough, tough choices about things we're going to do. And for us to ask for $2 million or so for this project to be funded in next year's budget cycle, is a real tough I, one. I think it's already been decided on. No, it, no, it hasn't. Mm -hmm. The 1.4 million but is is in a CIP, but it hasn't been. Hasn't but it's been not It's not yet. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's it's the in the bank. It's the cash will pay it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's one of our exceptions to the to the uh, I believe it is the, the town vote. Yeah. I'm sorry. I can hear that down there. What was that? To the vote. Uh, the. Uh, so we have the bond approval by the Correct. voter approval. I voter believe this is a qualified exclusion. That was the interpretation at the time. But I think, <laughs> just to make it clear though, so while the prior council voted and approved $1.4 million to this project, there is a second approval required of the council, which is to actually fund, uh, how to fund the actual allocation, whether it's by bond or assessment or whatever it might be. So it's not a 100% done deal because it can still be rejected. No, we don't need right. to wait for the next budget cycle. If this council wanted to move forward, you could choose to. Correct. Right. And, and I think that's really why we, we wanted to give Mr. Grandin the chance to um, talk with you, not to necessarily review his project per se, right, but right. to say, you know, here's the, the value of it, and he's waiting for us to make, you know, um, a decision, and we simply are not prepared to... Uh, move forward without understanding what we think the real trigger would be. Is it, you know, how much investment do we really need to have uh, in order to give us some security that we can recoup our investments? And, you know, for the very reason, Tigers Parkway that we have, um, you know, we made some bold moves out there and it hasn't, it has not uh, yielded the type of return that we've talked about. So, you know, you understand the council being very sensitive toward that um, to get in the same situation for you know, another area of town. And again, we're trying to get a sense of what is that trigger, what's, you know, we don't have that answer right now. The difference is the parkway is speculative. Right. This has, and, and the real right. proposition is, this is the 237 residential unit subdivision estimated value of $70 million. Is that enough to give us confidence or not? Right. Well, Karen, I, I, think what, I think the big trigger is us having to explain to the taxpayers how we're going to spend $2 million to add um, more units, more housing units in this town when we already know that we have people in town that are furious over the fact that we're building out more units and they believe that the town can't handle any more housing units. We're, we're, like I said before, we're already at a lean budget. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's difficult to sit here and, I mean, we all love housing. It's great. It's wonderful. We want to support contractors. Mm -hmm. But we also have to make sure that we can sustain our town and, and sustain Absolutely. the people that are living in it and sustain their taxes. Mm -hmm. And adding $2 million on top of what we don't already have is really hard for me to even comprehend. And for the record, I think we actually are a very forward-thinking council. To, to, so what, what, I guess the question I would have probably more for Chair, what, what, what action items are we looking at coming out of here? Is this more, if this Nothing. is just informal and educational, then, uh, by, uh, you know, continue with the, you know, the presentation and we should give you the floor and let you, you know, finish out what you need to say and what you want to say. And, you know, I, I don't think we need to debate it. I think we just need to listen. Yeah, so, so f uh, from a Chair's perspective, this is purely informative mm -hmm. okay. uh, to see where we've been in the past, where we are today in regards to the comprehensive plan and then to listen to the proposal or listen to the project and then, you know, staff can take that information and try to determine what is the next best step um, to either come back to us with a proposal or not to. Um, I would personally just wait and see. Um, as far as the trigger, um, and, and everyone has a different perspective, so I'm using a, a personal perspective here. Um, 
the issue about housing density, housing concentration, the types of housing, the mixed use piece, um, is purely a planning board decision because this is not a contract zone, so it has to be based upon the zones that we currently allow and the definitions and that type of thesis. This is strictly about whether or not the town pays to bring sewer across the turnpike and up to that particular point and what the advantage is to that. Um, for me personally, the trigger point is that um, what is the complete phase out in which we start realizing the mixed use and commercial piece of that because that is the qualifier in which we use the TIF. Um, if we're not going to see it, um, then to me, I don't know if I'm necessarily inclined to be in favor of a residential TIF for residential properties. Uh, we've never used that before in this town. We can't. It's not even allowed. Right. And so I don't want to, I mean, there's always been kind of a borderline with some projects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so whether there's 237 units or whether there's five, it doesn't matter to me the number of units because it all has to apply to the, the permits who control it, the number of permits available. Planning board will control what is allowed in there. It's, it's really about the phase out and where is the mixed use and where do we then see the return on that investment. Well, impact analysis. Right. I mean, the, the right. I, I need to see that impact analysis. Right. It's but an American. 55 plus uh, arguably is somewhere. Because I think that then answers that. Peter's question about why is it beneficial to the right. town because it's where do we realize the return in the taxes as a result of the investment. Ken has been hearing these conversations from us for a year and a half and frankly we, we wanted him to we want to broaden the conversation so we could hear it from you, and we could hear it, frankly. I guess I'd like to know what, what so we talked about bringing the sewer up to Brennan Hill Road, and that can actually opened up. Can I just up quickly go through? I just want to make a couple of points. Can I, can I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so I think the, the point that I'd like to, that I'm, I'm asking about is once we get up to Running Hill Road, what does that open up for us? I mean, if, it, is, if there's further development, it looks like it's fairly tracked up up there. So right. Th there's a there's a significant uh, amount of acreage that um, is that opens up for larger office users, um, larger commercial users, and that's where the interest has been um, in terms of some uh, potential you know, 75 to 100,000 square feet users. That's what they're interested in. They like the view coming down. Um, certainly, there's a um, you know with with that and a few other buildings that are there. There's that sense that it could extend. Um, extend up from some <coughs> have, you, have you talked with those landowners to see if they'd be willing to partner and share the cost with you? Because mm -hmm. they would have the advantage of doing that, right? Those, those we, landowners predominantly are, uh, there's, there's homes on there or they're not a developer, so to speak. So I don't, I'm not aware that they're in a position to do that. Just a question. Mm -hmm. So with that, we have um, about a minute and a half. Um, so um, I think this is a good first conversation. And um, you know, if we can uh, maybe sit on this information that we received and then I can take a poll from everyone else uh, what, whether or not we want to have a second workshop or what additional information or what might be needed or what direction um, we can move forward from there. But thank you, Mr. Grande, for coming. We do appreciate thank it. Thank you, Steve. Um, with that, we'll uh, adjour I will adjourn to the regular meeting.
I'm going to assume it's on. So uh, welcome, everybody. This is the regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council for Wednesday, June 7, 2017. And um, we are calling to order. If you would join me in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Donovan? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Cazzo? Here. Chairman Baybay? Here. And moving into general public comments, item number four. It's an opportunity for anybody in the public that would like to speak on an item that is not on the um, agenda. Uh, you do have three minutes that you can speak at the podium. And if you could state your name and your address in Scarborough or where you're from, it would be greatly appreciated for the clerk. I'm a little nervous. Uh, my name is Jessica Liddy. I reside at 501 Black Point Road. I am here on behalf of the Wentworth PTA. I am the president. We have an upcoming family movie night end of the year event on the 16th. And we recently learned that we could have food trucks at our event, but we needed to pay for them, which we would gladly do if we had the funds to feed everyone that came, but we don't. So we didn't realize if we had our parents pay for the event or the food trucks that we could no longer have the food trucks. Now I know there's rules and laws. I'm here on behalf of all the kids and the parents at um, the event. If we could maybe get a one-time waiver, and if that's not possible, at least to kind of put out there a consideration for different booster type events um, that food trucks would be allowed to be paid for by our parents. I'm not sure what else y'all need from me, but. That was kind of it. I didn't know if, what we could do if we could get a waiver, if that was at all possible, if you would consider it. It's a nonprofit event. Uh, there will be no funds raised um, other than like, for the school, and it's really a community event um, to be hosted at Wentworth. Sure. So um, this is a public comment section, so there's really, oh, so there, this really isn't a dialogue. Uh, okay. But I'd be happy to talk to you after the meeting or if you'd like to give me a, um, a call. I would definitely do. We didn't know. We just wanted to put it out there. We knew this was the last kind of meeting before, and we just wanted to put the idea in your head to beg for mercy and say, <laughs> please consider it. But I will reach out and contact you tomorrow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Is there anybody else I would like to speak? Not seeing any, we'll close public comment. Moving on to item number five, minutes from the May 17, 2017 regular meeting. They're not available. And not available, so we'll table that until the next meeting. Any no items for adjustments to the agenda? So moving on to item seven, treasurer's warrants. I'll sign those as the evening goes by. And moving into order number 17-049, seven o'clock public hearing and schedule a second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 608, Town of Scarborough Fireworks Display Ordinance, section two. Definitions, Section 3, Regulations and Codes, Section 4, Permit Required, Section 5, Application Procedure, and Section 12, Consumer Fireworks, as presented by the Ordinance Committee. I'd like to open up the uh, meeting for a public hearing. Would anybody like to speak? Good evening, everybody. Of course, most of you know me. I'm Jeff Graham. I am the manager of Phantom Fireworks over in Scarborough. Um, we know this ordinance is going through. Um, I did read the other day in the paper that we are going to have to perform some sort of notification at our showrooms. I haven't been approached about this yet. Um, what is exactly what we are going to have to do if this ordinance passes? So um, well, again, this is not really a uh, dialogue kind of conversation, but what I will do is keep track of the questions, and the chair of the uh, ordinance committee can address those as part of his presentation if you'd like. Okay. Okay. All right. Anything else? For now, that's oh, it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> any other uh, comments on the fireworks ordinance? Not seeing any. Is there a motion? So moved. Your second. 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 And I'd like to turn it over to the uh, chairman of the ordinance committee for an overview. Uh, this uh, uh, will be voted on at second reading in two weeks. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, 
the uh, ordinance is intended to uh, balance the interests of those who would like to be protected from uh, uh, fireworks uh, uh, nuisance, uh, yet keeping it alive for those who enjoy fireworks uh, around the 4th of July and around the New Year's date. I fall into the latter category, but, uh, but appreciate that there are many people, and we heard from many people, who uh, felt that it needed to be more restrictive. Uh, and so the things, the, the fundamental uh, elements of the change are that we're going to go from five days to four, dropping July the 5th. We're going to uh, conclude uh, the allowance of fireworks at 10 p.m. Uh, uh, we are going to uh, have a good neighbor or respect your neighbor policy that will require uh, people who want to let off fireworks during those days to be proactive uh, and respectful of their neighbors, uh, check in to make sure that this isn't going to create an unreasonable burden, uh, make the kind of adjustments that a good neighbor would make. Uh, we have included a provision that uh, makes uh, the owners of properties uh, potentially liable. Uh, which came about as a result of the chief pointing out that it is quite difficult uh, under the circumstances on, as you can imagine, July 3rd, July 4th. The police department is out straight. Uh, 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 complaints are coming in uh, and uh, having officers go out and try and identify who exactly it was, who was the offending party, uh, is problematic. So we're trying to make homeowners be more accountable and more responsible. Uh, that question has raised the point about, well, gee, uh, there's all sorts of circumstances under which a homeowner could be uh, uh, completely free of blame or, or responsibility. And I think the answer to that question is that the police and code enforcement are trained to use good judgment. Uh, and in almost every discretionary matter, they have to decide, is this appropriate to issue a ticket or not? Uh, we have uh, qualitative standards which require the use of good judgment uh, uh, throughout our zoning ordinances. So this is something that they're all used to. Uh, as far as the question that the gentleman from Phantom Fireworks uh, brought up, uh, we have a requirement that the two fireworks or any fireworks company in town, retailer, will provide a notification to uh, each, uh, with each sale that Scarborough has a notification process. Uh, and they can have that in any sort of little slip of paper that goes with the receipt, goes into the bag, and would simply say that there is a notification process required to set off fireworks legally in Scarborough. Uh, and the responsibility then passes to the person who has purchased them. Some people don't intend to uh, let fireworks off in Scarborough, and they would obviously ignore that. Uh, but uh, we're, we are unique. Uh, not a lot of towns uh, uh, allow this, and we have two fireworks companies uh, right here in town, and so we, as an ordinance committee, felt it was appropriate to uh, place that responsibility on uh, the fireworks companies. Okay. Yes, Councillor Sinclair. Um, Councillor Bema, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Councillor Donovan, is it okay to read that section, that notice gonna... section? Yes, yeah, certainly, go right in. So basically, this is, the, this is the addition that the ordinance committee put on. Any uh, authorized retailer for the sale of consumer fireworks in the town of Scarborough shall provide written notice at the time of sale to all purchasers of con consumer fireworks at their Scarborough retail stores that a permit is required for use in the town of Scarborough as set forth Section 5 above. Okay. And the, uh, the only other thing I wanted to point out, um, this is something that we've been talking about for a long time, years. Um, and None of this was done lightly. In fact, um, Councillor Donovan totally put me to shame this year and really tackled this. Um, I had been working on it for the two years prior to this, and he took it to another level. 
um, and really involved the fire chief and the police department um, and the town manager. Um, I think it's very well written. I think it's very um, clear. We got rid of some things. We added some things. Um, I think it addresses some of the concerns that we heard from residents. Uh, I think it protects a lot of residents and their homes. Um, and I think it also holds people accountable if they do break the law. Um, some people don't want fireworks going off. I mean, I actually, I think I've sent you all the email. Someone was lighting off fireworks last Friday night in my neighborhood, two neighborhoods down from us, two nights in a row. And the woman was frustrated and I said, I feel you because it woke my four-year-old up. It was at 10 o'clock at night, it's frustrating. Um, so there's a need for this ordinance, and I think that people need to understand that this actually, I, a couple of people have said, well, it's really, it's really strict and it's really firm, and this actually isn't strict and firm. We're one of the only towns that you can let fireworks off. So I think people need to remember that. Um, and I'm, prou I'm proud of this ordinance, and I hope it passes tonight. If I could just provide a clarification, the actual just, um, and I apologize for not organizing this uh, maybe at the beginning. So the current order, which is 17-049, um, is more of the definitions document. The question and the reference and conversation is really about the next ordinance. That's true. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're not duplicating our conversation. It's still Hi. valuable. No, no, it's still valuable because we had a question about it. But just to keep in mind, there is another ordinance that deals, the next one deals with fireworks in this covers that right mm -hmm. the the uh, order that's before us now is uh, chapter 608 which is the fireworks display ordinance uh, we'll have 608a up next uh, the gentleman from Phantom Fireworks rightly did not appreciate that we weren't combining the two or that he shouldn't at this point take the opportunity to speak so it was simply a misunderstanding yeah. uh, but uh, uh, I, w I proceeded with an explanation of 608A. The explanation for 608 uh, uh, probably takes a lot less time. And this was brought to us by Chief Thurlow uh, because of uh, the fact that 608 was passed before the consumer fireworks law statute at, from Augusta was adopted. That created a definition of consumer fireworks. We needed to update the fireworks display ordinance, and that's really what 608, the amendments to 608 is doing. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? On 608? Or 608. 608. Let's stick with okay. Yeah, I'll 608. Just clarification, we're not, we're not having second reading tonight, this is just the hearing. Correct. First reading. Okay. First reading. This is first reading? No. This is, uh, this is the public hearing and to schedule a second reading at a subsequent time. So we're not actually voting on the second reading this evening. So with that, anything else? Um, we don't need to vote because we're correct. correct. So moving on to the next item, which is order number 17-050, uh, 7 o'clock public hearing and schedule a second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 608A, Town of Scarborough Consumer Fireworks Ordinance Section 5, Use of consumer fireworks restricted, Section 4, violation of enforcement, and Section 7, notice, as presented by the Ordinance Committee. I'd like to open up the floor to a pub any public comment regarding this item. Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. And um, any other comments from Council regarding uh, the conversation and the question that was proposed? Councilor Hayes? Yeah, and I think I've, and I've actually had an opportunity to talk to the committee members, but, you know, I think it is well written. There are there are just a couple pieces that um, strike me. One is, and I think it's already been referenced, is under the violation enforcement piece, section 5A. It's been modified to say any person who violates the provisions of this ordinance and the owner of any property upon which the violation of the ordinance occurs shall commit a civil violation punishable by a penalty of not less than $100, blah, blah, blah. The only concern I have with that is that I know there are a lot of individuals in Scarborough that may rent their property during the summer months. If in fact there's, there's fireworks that are being set off and it's inappropriate and the property owner didn't have any advance knowledge of that or permission given, I think that's a little hard. I've already talked about that. I, I just raised a concern about that. I know in our neighborhood we've had a bunch of kids that are out in the neighborhood that have gone across other people's properties and done things. So I'm just a little concerned, and I, 
The explanation is that officers will use their discretion. I still have a concern we're putting our officers in a really tough spot. So one suggestion I have would be if there's a way we could come back and revisit this after a year and see if there are issues and what has risen. The other piece of it specifically that I had a question about is on the, it actually references report your neighbors, respect your neighbors. And on that it says you need to respect your neighbors and you cannot use fireworks in any way that could unreasonably disturb your neighbor's comfort and repose or infringe upon their neighbor's safety or personal enjoyment of their property. And again, I have some concerns about, you know, you could have a situation in a neighborhood where, you know, someone could be setting off fireworks and their neighbors are absolutely fine. Half a block away, a block away, someone could be setting off the exact same fireworks and there may be a neighbor that's concerned and one person may be precluded from being able to do it based on sort of some objectivity. I'm just concerned without some real clear definition of unreasonably disturb that's in the eyes of the beholder. We're going to put officers in a really awkward position every time they get called out on one of these issues. They're going to make a resident mad. They're either going to make the person calling saying it's unreasonably disturbing me. If the officer doesn't own that, they're going to be upset. If the officer, you know, agrees with the neighbor and stops the property owner from doing the fireworks, they're going to be upset. I just would really like to think about that. But again, I'd be comfortable with if we say we're just going to reevaluate this after a year and see what issues we have, I'd be fine with that. Any other comments? Counsel Chiasso. So I did ask some previous questions in writing and I'll defer to Counselor Donovan if he wants to share those publicly. I don't want to go through all of those. I do want to say, though, that the issue of notice I think was misunderstood and that was my fault for not wording the question properly. I wasn't referring to the commercial side of things. That's very clear how that permitting process works. I was referring to this consumer fireworks permit and application. And if the question, if it's just a documentation issue in terms of we know my house, 17 Elmwood Avenue, is using fireworks on this day, or is it a permit, in which case I have to apply and receive permission from the fire department in order to use those. Because that to me sets off a little bit of a different requirement in terms of administration because I then have to either wait for the fire department to say a blanket statement, yes, everybody can light fireworks, or no, there's a moratorium in town because of this issue or that issue. So I'd like a little bit more clarity on how that process is determined and who's administering that. It sounds like it's fire, but again, it sounds like it could be a bit onerous, especially around the holiday season. I think the question of the cost of notice for the businesses in town is also a concern of me, and only because it sounded like from what you had initially said in your explanation that whether it would be a piece of paper that they handed to every customer, I can see that eventually being somewhat costly. Would they be allowed to print a placard and paste it at the exit and say, please refer to the sign or just draw their attention to it on the way out, or do you expect them for compliance reasons to give individual notice to each one, or can they just simply refer to the sign and say, please read the sign on your way out, it's required, and then move on so they're not paying to have hundreds of thousands of pieces of paper going forward. That would be my question. How do they comply with that request? What's the boundaries for complying with that request? Does that make sense? He's taking notes, so it must. Well, he could be taking notes to ask me later. Okay, that's okay. I'm happy to answer. The notice provision was intended to be an individual notice, and that's because when we reviewed the materials from Phantom Fireworks, they already printed most of what the specific requirements were in the town of Scarborough, dates, hours, things of that nature. So it was already going out in every bag that was sent out, so it didn't seem like it was going to be difficult to add there is a notification process to be allowed to let off fireworks in the town of Scarborough, see Chapter 608A, see the Scarborough website, town of Scarborough website. As to your other question, it's not a permit process. We became convinced by the testimony of Chief Thurlow and his staff 
that that represented a liability risk that uh, that we did not want to assume as a town, as a municipality. Uh, and so it became simply a notification process where it's an obligation of each person who wants to use consumer fireworks on the 4th of July in the town of Scarborough, to f and that can be done uh, by an online uh, submission uh, or at every fire station or the police station. And it's just, it's, it's not an approval. It's drop it off, email it. Uh, so pretty simple. So what I would like to suggest, because this is um, the intent was to schedule um, the second reading, is that if there are any more questions, that um, maybe we should contact the chair of the ordinance committee, and he can include those in the final presentation at the second reading, because it's not really intended to have a debate at this time about the value of this. So um, I have some for you. I won't share it today, but I do have. Please. I'll submit them, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, order number, moving on to order number 17-052, it's a 7 o'clock public hearing and schedule a second reading. Sorry, I missed one. Got to back up. To vote to. Order number 17-051, a 7 o'clock public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 313A, the Town of Scarborough Property Tax Relief, Section 5, Determination of Eligibility and Amount of Eligibility as presented by the Ordinance Committee. Is there anybody in the public that would like to speak on the item? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing and move this to a second reading. And just for the public uh, to, to understand, the change in the recommendation is to increase the amount from 500 to $600. This is the second reading, correct? This is the second reading. This is? Yeah. This is your hand. Oh, okay, I apologize. In which case, I'd like to move the issue. Absolutely. Sorry. I move. Motion. Second. Motion. And um, overview from the Ordinance Committee. Uh, All right. Uh, this was uh, the <coughs> pros and cons <coughs> of increasing from $500 to $600 the uh, 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 award that would be provided to um, senior property uh, senior property owners <coughs> uh, who qualified uh, was uh, reviewed carefully. Uh, we uh, decided that it, uh, because. Uh, nothing had been done in a great deal of time. Taxes had gone up a considerable amount since the $500 limit uh, had been set, that it was appropriate at this time. It did not affect this year's budget because we had uh, allocated sufficient funds, plus there were $64,000 worth of reserve funds, and that would exceed any reasonable likelihood of what we would have to pay out uh, based on last year's uh, uh, performance. So uh, based on that, uh, it, we unanimously endorsed uh, the idea of increasing uh, the payment from $500 to $600. Any questions or comments from Council? I actually have one question. Um, so I know how the $600 came forward because it was an increase that had not happened. Um, I would prefer, if possible, to possibly add an amendment so that this is just annually with some metric, so that this does not need to be revisited after so many years. Um, that way there's the automatic adjustment that goes into place. <coughs> the question I have is, did the committee discuss what metrics that might, um, could be tied to, whether it's you know CPI, whatever and, it might be? And, and we, we did talk about all the different ways in which uh, uh, improvements might be made and concluded that a second year of data would help us to understand uh, are we in a stable situation? Uh, uh, is the best way to go to have kind of a COLA adjustment? Yeah. Or are there stepped levels? Because you can do it in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And so we thought that would require some careful analysis by the Ordinance Committee. Uh, and so uh, we will have the data after October 15th. The Ordinance Committee will, I think, probably take it right up and start to look at what should be the next step. And your suggestion, Mr. Chair, was one that was right there in the forefront. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor St. Clair. I think part of the reason why we did it this way was we really wanted to get that $600 into the system and have it get going um, because we did get numerous requests for it 
and it was important at the, important at the time. Um, so I think that's why we decided to do it this way and then give us more time to work out the formula that was mm -hmm. that should be used in the future. And if you can take a footnote, um, one possible solution is to tie it into the tax rate increase mm -hmm. in that given year or, de yes. or decrease. Definitely one of the ways I mean, in I which we've we never seen a decrease in taxes, but not just going to happen. Yeah. Well, it's possible. possible. So, mm -hmm. so with that, um, thank, thank you, you for the answer. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? Not seeing any. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. The next item is order number 17-052. It's a public hearing and schedule a second reading on the request for discontinuance of a portion of Beach Ridge Road and schedule a public hearing as presented to us by the town engineer. I'd like to open it up for public hearing. Would anybody like to speak on the item? I love you. <laughs> Hopefully my wife now will watch my visit. No, actually there is a typo because this is the second reading, so I apologize. Um, but is there anybody that would like to speak at the public hearing? Not seeing any, we'll close and is it right? No. It would take the type of second public hearing down there. The second reading has Oh scheduled, scheduled public hearing. Okay, it's already been scheduled. Yeah. Sorry, a couple of typos. My fault. Um, so this is a to schedule a second reading, so that will be in two weeks. And moving on to the next item, order number 17-054, it's a 7 o'clock public hearing in action on the new request for a food handler's license. A, Melissa Carr doing business as Aurora Provisions at the Beach, located at 4 Steel Rock Drive. And B, BHM17 LLC doing business as Beach House Market, located at 27 East Grand Avenue. Uh, we'll open up the public hearing. Is there anybody that would like to speak on the item? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. And this is an action item, so if there is a motion from the council. So moved. Second. Any comments or questions from council? Councilor Foley. I'm just happy to see someone took this on. It's been sitting empty for a couple of years, and I know the mm -hmm. folks down at Pine Point um, have been hoping that someone would uh, come in and continue its use. So um, good luck to them. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any, um, and uh, the, most, uh, the pleasure of the council. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Next item is resolution 17-003, act on resolution 17-003, requesting the town council support on transportation improvement program projects to PACs, um, and this is presented to us by the town engineer. And I would like to open that up to um, Actually, if I can ask the town engineer to maybe do a presentation before any public comment. I'm going to make this really brief. Um, I was here a, a year ago when we put in an application um, for the 2019 funds through PACS for this section of East Grand Avenue. Unfortunately, it was not funded. Um, there were other projects in the region that were further along with their design. Um, since then, we have moved our preliminary design forward. We've had some public meeting um, down at Pine Point as part of our master plan effort and initiative. Um, this is a complete streets project, and there's um, the cover letter in your packet um, that talks about um, the, the rebuild of that roadway, including the drainage system and um, bike and ped facilities, um, as well as parking and, um, and other amenities. So at this point, we have moved the, um, the project forward with the design, and we are again reapplying to PACS, this time for the construction funds for the 2020 and 2021 complex projects. They've kind of changed how their funding mechanism and the application works. So I'm again in front of you just asking for an endorsement of the application. Um, it is not securing funds at this time or securing our match associated with it. It's basically a piece to the application to say the town supports it and supports staff putting in the application to, to move this project forward. Uh, is there any questions for the town engineer? Oh, oh no, for the town engineer. No. Mm -hmm. no. Uh, Councilor Hayes? Just a quick question. So the schematic we have, I mean, is this the actual design that's proposed or is it just kind of a 
placeholder to, for the process in the application? And yep, it's a it's a placeholder. We our application is, is pretty thick, yeah. so I didn't include that, but um, it has in that the cost estimate. So basically, that's kind of the summary of the application, giving you the costs and um, really the highlights of the project. And that preliminary design is not complete. So um, allow some input from the right. Project. So we have more public uh, meetings scheduled down there, and um, and really because it's so far out for construction funds, 2020, they just wanted to see that we're further along, which we are substantially from where we were. Um, it's just we still have obviously more than two years to kind of complete that process <laughs> and before we start digging. Thank you. Any other questions for the town engineer? Not seeing any, thank you very much. I'd like to open it up to a public hearing if anybody would like to speak on the item. <coughs> Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. And this is an actual item, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions for staff or council? Yes, Council Caso. Um, I'm just curious, does this, does this typically need a, a resolution for support? Don't we typically just, I mean, does it need a formal resolution? Well, I think to really fulfill the application requirements, it's best to have a formal action of the elected uh, legislative body and other seems than a, to be the best form. Other than a vote, I mean, because I think typically we just authorize the process, don't we, through a, through a vote? Do we actually do? I mean, I'm not questioning. I'm just, I don't recall ever doing resolutions for projects like this, but we, we do. Okay. Yes. Okay. We can is that a question there? Tody says we have. I, why, no, I, I'm, <laughs> I've been, I'm stand corrected. Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> Keep it, keep in mind this is just an application, so this no, is yeah. Understand. Nothing's guaranteed. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any, all in favor. And that is unanimous, thank you. Uh, there is no old business at this time. Moving into new business, order number 17-055. It's a first reading and referred to the planning board on the proposed fourth amendment to contract zone I. Frank R. Good or is that one? I uh, Frank R. Goodwin. Um, e and F Limited Liability Company in Raymond C. Field Land Rover Dealership located at 371 U.S. Route 1 as presented to us by the Planning Department. If I could um, ask for an overview from one of our staff members. Jace here from a process point of view, the yeah. applicants. Uh, as uh, Mr. Hall just mentioned, I can speak just really on, in terms of process at this point, and then um, maybe the applicants are prepared to give you more of an overview of what they're looking to do. Um, but hopefully in your packets you received uh, a memorandum from me dated June 1st. Essentially what you're being asked to do is consider uh, a first reading, which um, if, a, if uh, the council sees fit to move this forward, it would go to the planning board. The planning board re begin their preliminary site plan review of this process. Um, once the applicant receives preliminary site plan review, it would come back to the council for set public reading, uh, I'm sorry, public hearing, second reading, approval. And then again, should you actually adopt the contract zone amendment, it would go back to the planning board for final site plan review. Um, if it fails here tonight, then that's what happens. Um, so there's sort of two, two questions before the board tonight. Um, and then also in my memo, just provide a real brief background. The initial contract zone was in 1996. It's the first contract zone in the community. Um, it was first amended in 2000, which enabled the building to increase by roughly 1,300 square feet from the original 8,000 to about 9,300 square feet. In 2004, there was a second am amendment, which enabled another 4,000 square foot addition up to about 30, uh, 13, th yeah, 13,700 square feet. Most recently in 2016, the applicant was before you for uh, a roughly 1,000 square foot increase. That actually hasn't been um, uh, enacted or, or taken place, that development didn't take place, and that was actually going to really redesign the whole building. Um, that was pretty much a, a full redesign. And now the applicant's before you for, to uh, seek an increase of a building up to 16,500 square feet, and I'm sure they're prepared to talk maybe a little bit more about the details of what that would look like. So right. I'm happy to answer any other questions, but we'll turn it over to them.
Uh, good evening. My name is Paul Strowski from Sebago Technics, and with me is uh, Ryan Senator, Ryan Senator Architects. Um, well, as you, some of you may know, last year this was in front of the town council for a contract zone amendment to increase the allowable square footage to roughly 14,000, I think 750 square feet. And again, that project has never come to fruition. Uh, some of the dealership brandings have changed. It requires an additional uh, expansion onto the building, which would actually uh, exceed the maximum allowable square footage in that recently enacted contract zone amendment. Uh, therefore, as that was actually approved and recorded, we are back again to request in a, uh, another amendment to increase that allowable square footage to 16,500. As currently planned, the building is approximately 15,600 square feet, so we've added a little bit of leeway in there if the building for any reason expands we won't have to come back again um, apparently we didn't learn from the mistake we made at Mercedes um, it, it, it will drastically change some of the uh, exterior of the of the building um, there's not a drastic increase on total parking uh, they're actually with the expansion are going to lose some parking in the front of the building which will then be um, put back by removal of that uh, of the existing rock wall or rock climbing area for the vehicles um, and on the back of this is a picture of the existing facade as as looking on on route one uh, and again the current branding of the Land Rover and Jaguar um, is is drastic from this and I'll turn it over to Ryan to kind of discuss some of the proposed building changes I'm Ryan Senator with RSA. Um, uh, like Paul had mentioned, we we came uh, before you about a year ago with a very similar rendering here. Um, many of you may not notice much of a difference uh, in terms of the architectural design. Uh, it's virtually identical to what we had uh, approved um, by yourselves in the planning board. Um, essentially, what what happened was we were the the brand uh, the JLR Jaguar Land Rover guidelines had changed a bit kind of fluidly as we were designing the building and we needed a bit more interior office space and so what what that kind of made us do was push out uh, the service bay 16 feet um, so that basically the, the exterior effect change is this area right here um, and then this wall of the showroom uh, bumped out a few feet so that's really the, the physical change to the design um, a bit of a footprint change but in terms of materials architectural design, um, everything else is virtually identical. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, um, that's kind of the scope of why we're here. Any questions for the owners or the engineers, architects? Any questions? No? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. And this is uh, obviously an actual item, so if there is a motion from the council. So moved. Second. And any questions or comments? Seems in order. Not seeing any. Um, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is order number 17-046, first reading and referred to the planning board on the proposed amendment to chapter 405, the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, definition of a golf course as presented to us by the planning department. If I could have the interim director speak on this <laughs> before public comments. Good evening. The owner of the Willowdale Golf Course came to us a, um, a while back with a request to have a dwelling unit included in an accessory building, an accessory use at the golf course. And the reason for the request, or the reason to do this accessory unit, was really to have an on-site manager be able to stay on the golf course and um, ostensibly to help with security and have someone there on a 24-hour basis. And what it turned out is that where Willowdale, Willowdale Golf Course is, it, interesting enough, he could do a single-family unit 
um, as part of the, the um, underlying zoning, but he couldn't do um, an apartment or a um, dwelling unit in an existing building, which is what he really wanted to do. So we took a look at, at this from a couple of different um, ways. We looked at, um, you know, is this a common use for a golf course? Do you, um, golf courses tend to have an on-site manager or a dwelling unit or anything like that? And what we found by uh, talking to some other uh, courses across the state and the National Association is that it is not uncommon. It's not the majority of courses, but it happens um, a lot to, to really take care of that security measure. Um, so we looked at a couple of different ways to do it, and we really came back to we didn't need to change anything in the, in, on the zone itself where he was. We looked at the definition. And the reason we took uh, this course was because we already had an example of a similar type of uh, use or accessory use in the mini warehouse storage units. So in the existing zoning ordinance, we have a provision that does allow for an, access, for an accessory use, uh, accessory dwelling unit uh, for a mini storage for the exact same reason. It's a security issue. So what we did is we really lifted that language that came from um, the description of the mini warehouse and we incorporated it into the definition of the golf course. So that's why there's no map amendment, there's nothing um, that else that's changing. It's simply a, an additional phrase in the um, uh, definition of the, of the golf course. And really what it says is, um, I'll give you the, the first part of the language which already exists, which is a golf course, put the glasses on, a golf course may include a clubhouse, shelter for players, and other accessory structures, including, and we've added, one dwelling unit in an accessory structure and is an accessory use to the golf course, provided the dwelling is occupied by a resident facility manager or by an on-duty or by on-duty employees of the facility. Um, so we felt like that covered um, his particular need, and it really made sense for, for golf courses in general. Um, we did take this to the Long Range Planning Committee, and the Long Range Planning Committee um, certainly felt this was reasonable, but what they did ask, um, there was a, originally we had inserted the word only a residential manager, and they felt like that was going to be restrictive if there was a spouse or something like that, um, or a partner, or whatever, that we, they wanted to remove that word um, only. And we did make that change, um, and that's what's before you tonight, is a change in the definition of golf course that will allow an accessory uh, dwelling unit in a, um, in a building such as a storage facility or a um, um, clubhouse or something like that. Thank you. Any, yeah, any questions for the interim director? Not seeing any, thank you very much. Any public comment? Not seeing any, we'll close the public uh, comment section. Um, and um, this is a first reading, yeah, first reading and refer, so um, an action to refer to this um, to the planning board. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments from council? Not seeing any. Oh, oh sorry. I, I just wanted to, to, to mention that part of the long-range planning discussion too was the the thought that predominantly the use is going to be more an in interim kind of thing. So if the person has to spend the evening there, or it's I don't know if it's they have the option of being a full-time dwelling if they want it. But I think the intent was more of case you know if somebody's closing, and then opening the next morning they get a place to live. So it's not like it's a they have the right to put a regular house on there that would be different. This was kind of a uh, almost like adding a, an apartment kind of thing to an existing structure. So. Uh, long range planning didn't really have any issues with it. So, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Not seeing any. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next item is Order Number 17-057. Act on the request to appoint Larissa Crockett as the acting town manager, in accordance with Chapter 200, the Scarborough Town Charter, Article 3, Section 305, absence of the town manager as presented to us by the town manager. You can have an overview by the town manager before public comment. Yes, uh, as is referenced in the title of this action, uh, the town charter provides for uh, the event of my absence. And through the years during my tenure here, um, 
Most of the time it's been uh, Chief Moulton that served in this capacity with your consent, uh, but uh, there have been periods of time when the HR director assumed those roles and responsibilities. I have placed this notice on file with the clerk as the charter requires, but it does require the consent of council and therefore it's before you this evening. Uh, regarding Ms. Crockett, uh, she holds the title. Her job description I think is very consistent with the sort of duties that may be required in my limited absence and she has passed her probationary period, so I, I think it's only fitting that we now uh, make this move. Thank you. Any public comments? Not seeing any, we'll close public comment and the uh, action of the council. So moved. Mm -hmm. Second. And any comments or questions, Council St. Clair? Um, is it in the charter that, my, my concern is um, that adding her name specifically. So is it in the charter that that the duties already go to the assistant town manager. So do you see what I'm saying? Like, I, I agree that it should go since we've mm -hmm. now established that we do have an assistant town manager and hopefully we'll continue to keep that position funded. Um, my concern is putting her name into that. Um, I would prefer to just leave it as whoever is having the office of the assistant town manager in case there is something that happens and we find ourselves with a new town assistant town manager, then we don't have to bring it back to council to change it again. Good point. That was my only concern. Yeah, good with point. That. The charter, um, perhaps we can pick that up the next time you review it, but the current charter language didn't recognize the position. Because we exist. never had it. So I think that's something we could pick up uh, should you go back and look at the uh, a former charter commission. So great suggestion, and uh, I'll make note of that. But it, in the meantime, I think we do need to name her specifically. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? <coughs> Not seeing any. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. And order number 17-058, act on the request to renew the town manager's contract. And this will be presented by the council chair as an overview. Um, and then I'll open it up to public comments. Um, just to kind of uh, go over the process that has taken place, um, there are certain stipulations within the manager's contracts that we must meet from a timeline perspective. Um, such as um, when we must provide a an uh, semi-annual and annual review, as well as in a contract year, or I should say in an expiring contract year, the manager or the town council and the manager must communicate with each other um, on the desire to enter the negotiations or the desire to, um, in essence, become a free agent, um, if that's kind of how you need to look at it. Um, all of those communications have been met and have been met according to the timeline. We did have an executive session in which we talked about um, how we would like to strategize um, that conversation and negotiations with the manager and I've uh, completed that as prescribed by both the charter and the town policy in which the council chair um, is to facilitate that um, and, and as a result of that um, the pre presentation of the existing contract um, or the continuation of the existing contract with no change in any of its provisions or benefits has been presented to you in which the manager has um, offered um, and is willing to accept. Um, highlight, um, I don't have the specifics, um, is that there is obviously a base salary that can adjust annually based upon um, the, uh, the um, increase that senior managers receive. And then there are other um, benefits that are normal with the position that includes um, expense reimbursements. Um, I think there's also a, a car uh, reimbursement, car uh, payment reimbursement. Um, as well as um, there is a bonus structure. There's also um, um, other benefits, health care and things such as that. So it is a continuation of the existing contract. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions before we open it up to public comment. That way they can hear any questions from council regarding that. Um, with that, I would like to open it up to public comment if anybody would like to speak on the item. Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. Is there uh, an action of the council? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? Council Donovan. Well, I think the world of our town manager. So uh, I'm very happy to uh, have us negotiate a new contract with him, and uh, I'm delighted to support this. Thank you. Um, just a one, um, I did want to mention, I forgot to mention, um, the council recently changed uh, one of its committees to include the responsibilities of um, personnel, um, uh, negotiations um, that is the appointments and personnel committee um, the primary purpose of that committee and they've been charged um, 
by the council is to complete a compensation analysis for the position. Um, it has nothing to do with Tom's performance, but rather we are all new to this um, contract negotiation because um, I don't think any of us, maybe Councilor St. Clair was here for the last one, correct, Councilor? So um, it's a very new process, so we wanted to see where are we in the market. Um, and so that committee is charged with doing the research along with our human resource director to see um, what type of benefits, what is the compensation, and to look at how we can uh, position ourselves um, going forward. So I do want you to be aware that we are looking at that and um, it's, it's being taken very seriously. Um, in the end, I, I just want to mention, um, very appreciative, especially since I get to work so close, closely with you, um, very appreciative of the fact that you're willing to continue employment. I think this town, this is one of the most significant investments the town can make, and I do appreciate the effort that you put into it, and the quality of uh, your professionalism um, speaks to also the value of your contract. So Great. I appreciate that very much. Any other questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item number eight, uh, non-action items, there are none. Item number nine, are standing and special committee reports. And I'll start with uh, Councilor Foley. That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> um, blah, blah. Eastern Trail Alliance had their 5K at O'Reilly's. I made it almost the whole 3.1 miles. Um, but it was a beautiful day. They had a great turnout, and I think they raised over almost $10,000. So uh, they were really, really pleased. Uh, also, for the Eastern Trail Alliance uh, right here in town, the True Choice True Town and Country Federal Credit Union uh, held an event on Saturday that was also uh, to help spread awareness, and that was also uh, very well received and attended. Um, I have a couple other committees met, but I'll let those chairs go ahead and share their reports. That's all I have. Great. Council St. Clair. Okay. Um, communications met, um, so we did a roundtable last week. It was really well attended, actually. Um, we were very encouraged with the numbers. We had about 20, 25 people, which I thought was good. Um, it's interesting because the, the bigger it got, the more nervous I got because I don't want it, I don't want, it's like you want people, but you don't want too many people because you don't want to lose that that intimate setting and that, that conversation piece, but actually it turned out to be perfect. Um, every single person that was there had time to speak, um, to give their opinion. We got a lot of um, really good feedback, actually, and, and some little things that we can be doing um, to improve our communication with the public that we've actually already been able to put into place, which is amazing to me in a couple of days. Um, we are reviewing our notes. We have a meeting on Friday. After the committee reviews the notes from the round table, we're actually going to distribute them to the council so that you guys can all read that and, and see what the, the people are thinking. Um, it was great too because we had a very diverse group, um, so I always think that's good. We had um, a couple of people that represented young families all the way up to our senior citizens group, which is fabulous. Um, we've actually been asked to go on the road, <laughs> so to speak, with our round table. Um, we've been asked by one of the beaches, and I think another one is going to, we're still scheduled to speak to them tomorrow, um, to come and actually focus, do a fo like a focus group in their areas. Um, and so that sort of made me think that if we're going to do it in one or two of those areas, why not go and try to hit all of the areas? So we're going to look into that and talk to some people um, and try to see if we have an interest in, in doing it. So far, so good. Um, you know, it was funny because some of the people that were, um, Nobody was combative. Nobody was upset. But, you know, a couple of the people that had strong opinions stayed after and, and really made it a point to thank us for what we were doing, which was kind of cool. I mean, they were, in one hand, they were upset by some of the things that we had done, but yet they saw that the council was willing to listen and hear what they had to say, um, and they were appreciative of that. And that was, a, that, you know, it's always nice when you walk out of a meeting feeling good about the meeting. And that was definitely one that I walked out of and felt like maybe we, we made a little bit of a difference in that one. So um, the election table. So part of our hope is that any town event will have a council table. And uh, the next real town event that we have is the election. Um, the cool thing about these, this election is that there are no counselors running um, in that. 
it's a school election, which means everybody can work at the council table. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested and you have time, please email me and I'll fill the slots. Otherwise, I'll have to be there all day by myself. Um, I don't think anybody wants that. So um, I think that's it for communications. Um, I did also want to say um, some of the feedback that we got, Sean, it was kind of neat because I think people are seeing the openness of the fact that we're willing to make changes and that one thing I talked about was how we're not, it's so easy to kind of go with the norm and stick to the norm because in your mind the norm has always worked, so why fix something when you don't think it's broken? But in reality, there's usually always sometimes better ways to do things. And it was really nice to see that these people could recognize that that you as a leader and us as a council are willing to make some of these changes. And that was a, that was really great feedback to get. Um, and it was nice to actually sit in front of someone and have them say that about this council. It was endearing. So um, that's it for communications for me. Thank you. Um, Councilor Rowan. So um, I said Comet, um, it is uh, just based on their meeting schedule, the, um, uh, they need to start talking about the September annual meeting. Um, and so they were uh, doing some planning for that, uh, as well as a lengthy discussion about the comprehensive plan um, and then the, uh, the financials for the year. Um, historic Preservation also met. It was also there. Um, they're also about to, heading off on a summer hiatus, um, but went over a, a number of issues, uh, most significantly um, a lengthy discussion about revisiting the list of 48 um, historically important uh, dwellings in town, um, given that what's happening with the um, the uh, redevelopment of 79 County Road, there are a couple other houses that have been remodeled and are no, kind of lost their historic significance, so that's going to be a big focus when they come back in the fall. Anything else? Uh, Councilor Hayes. Yeah, actually, I don't have anything this evening. It's kind yeah, of a really Councilor Donovan. Uh, Plenty Board met on Monday. Uh, no uh, I've been really trying to keep us all abreast of affordable housing projects. Nothing new on that, but uh, there was some interesting things. Uh, uh, out at 62 Muzzy Road, an Asian fusion restaurant is, uh, was before the planning board for a sketch plan review. It is located as you head from here to Walmart and you cross Muzzy Road, look diagonally to your right, across from the church. Uh, it's that site. There was a dilapidated building there, house there. Uh, uh, over here on Plaza Drive, uh, there's a mixed-use uh, development. Plaza is the little roadway that connects from McDonald's to Bank of uh, America. And there's a, a mixed-use uh, expansion of that area going in. Uh, out in North Scarborough uh, on uh, County Road, which is Route 22, <laughs> heading, into, uh, heading out to Gorham or heading into Portland, a uh, daycare facility, uh, it is to be located, uh, if you're at O'Donnell's, go back towards Portland about a quarter mile on the other side of the street, uh, O'Donnell's Nursery. Uh, and out on Hagus Parkway, across from that, you know the ponds. There are some visible ponds out there. A fitness facility uh, is uh, uh, undergoing site plan review. So some good activity uh, in town. Um, comprehensive plan, kickoff meetings. We all, I think most of all of us attended those. I think the public would be interested in that. We met the consultants. We had some one-on-one -on -one discussions to, with the consultants to uh, uh, express our own sense of what priorities are as the comprehensive plan kickoff occurred. Uh, I went to the GP COG annual meeting at St. Joseph's College. It was a half-day uh, affair, and you'd think it was going to be a, you know, a lot of time wasted, but I really thought it was excellent. The, New director there, Christina Egan, is a real firecracker. She is really on top of it. And I've gotten to know her as chair of the Metro Regional Coalition, having to work more closely with her on that. But the GP COG annual meeting had uh, sessions on marijuana with a Drum Drummond Woodson attorney who uh, told us a lot about where things were with the legislature. And I should probably give you a more of a written report on that rather than here. Uh, uh, South Portland uh, councilor, and South Portland is going s straight for it. They're, they are going to be very aggressive, uh, remarkably so. Everyone 
in the building, I think uh, all the municipal officials were saying, this is a go-slow process uh, because you can easily stub your toe, but that's not how South Portland is approaching it. Um, uh, Scarborough PD uh, <coughs> received the President's Award, the only award given by GP Cog uh, each year uh, for its Operation Hope program. Chief was there. It was great. Uh, that was exciting. Um, Ordinance Committee worked a lot behind the scenes, but uh, our next uh, uh, agenda is this Friday. But we were working, uh, the three members exchanging materials and, and, uh, and advancing things, so that was a busy time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Chiazzo. Uh, nothing since the last meeting. Great. Um, a couple of items for me. Uh, first, in the library, um, our next meeting is June 15th um, at the last meeting. They did want uh, me to express their gratitude uh, regarding the budget and our approval. Even though they may not have gotten everything, they were extremely happy that they did receive the approval for the CIP project for the solar panels. So I uh, did want to express their gratitude. Um, also wanted to um, mention that I've uh, provided them with at least um, your council email and phone numbers that are published uh, for public consumption because they are extremely pleased with the sudden support uh, for their projects and for their uh, uh, the public as well, um, so um, everyone is going to get probably a solicitation for the annual drive because um, they are, are constantly looking to uh, fund their gap. Um, wanted to mention Eco Maine has their annual meeting. I believe it's June 15th, uh, Council Donovan. Yes, uh, which will be my last um, as um, the former um, as, far as the outgoing uh, council member for this council, and Council Donovan has taken that over. So, you know, when we talk about um, uh, regional efforts. Um, and you talk about communications and changing communications. Um, I know that um, most of you may not have been watching 15 years ago when it was regional waste systems, but that is an incredible success story under the leadership of Kevin Roach and, and the members of their board. Um, it's just a, an absolutely uh, incredible organization that is doing um, really good things for all of the um, member communities. Um, you know, and that, that was when this council uh, not only did a very good job locally in representing Scarborough, but really focused a lot on regional efforts. And, you know, that was with the help of uh, Councilor Foley Ferguson, Sue Foley Ferguson, Mark Maroon, Patrick O'Reilly, Jeff Messer, and quite a few people. So um, it was, uh, Scarborough was reckoned with, uh, could not be reckoned with as part of our involvement because we had a very strong influence. And that is a, a perfect product. So I'm very happy about their growth and where they are today. And last, just as a notification, um, as chair, wanted to provide, and I don't have the date in the top of my head, but in the second meeting for July, um, June, uh, July and August, if you aren't aware, our policy is that we will only have one meeting. It's the first meeting of the month, um, the first Wednesday? Third, third meeting. Third, third sorry. Third Wednesday of the month. Third Wednesday. So um, the goal is that in July it would be the first, um, that's not July 4th, is it the first one? No, it's the third sure. Wednesday of July and August. Right. Right. So it's the first and third. So we're going to have a meeting the third, which is our regular. We don't have one on the first. I'm trying to schedule first a workshop. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was the third. So it would be the first meeting in July that will be the workshop gotcha. um, that will cover goals and our metrics. Um, and then um, the goal of that is to uh, identify where we are in our goals and those metrics and then also try to uh, um, either reassess where we are, but then also I'd like to close that out with a discussion around our communications and norms um, and get a reaffirmation of where we are with that. Um, so I'm going to be sending out a survey and the information here very quickly. Um, I apologize. I would have done it soon enough. For some reason, I was thinking it was the third <coughs> Wednesday of July that um, we did not have a meeting. So I've got to get off my keyser and get this done. So I'll get working on it. Um, with that, um, I have nothing else. Town manager's report? Yes, thank you. Uh, first. Uh, Thank each and every one of you uh, for the employment contract. I, I really do appreciate the relationship and having worked in four different communities over 25 years, I can tell you it's so much more rewarding when I'm working with uh, folks that are all, we're all kind of working in the same direction. Um, and I, I think I can say that on behalf of staff, it, it really makes such an appreciable difference in terms of job satisfaction, but also productivity. And I really feel as though uh, we've got a good team working in the same direction, so thank you. Uh, I wanted to mention that I have organized a site walk with the residents in Pine Point regarding Avenue 2. Uh, we had a very productive meeting. One of the things that came out of that was 
some questions and interest and in, I think a recognition that getting down on the ground and understanding uh, the natural features, uh, maybe what trees they want to save, what mm -hmm. sort of landscaping is being proposed, uh, everyone to a person thought that was a great idea. So we've arranged that for June 15th at 2 p.m. I expect uh, anywhere from four to six residents will be there, uh, the landscape architect and I think the uh, homeowner as well. So I'll certainly report back. This matter, as you may recall, is scheduled to come back to you um, at your next meeting, two weeks. 21st. And so uh, I'll be coordinating with the council chair in that regard and hopefully have some good news to report. Uh, again, very positive first meeting and hope we'll continue that momentum uh, with the site walk. I did want to mention that a number of councilors I think have been contacted. Uh, there's a resident down here off Soria Road in the Sawgrass subdivision who's having expressed some concerns with a, a neighbor uh, regarding um, what really is medical marijuana lawfully uh, being grown in the backyard. And it's raised a number of issues. Uh, as you're probably aware, we simply rely on state statute for medical marijuana at this point. And um, heretofore, there have not been all that many complaints, frankly. Um, of course, the other issue looming before us is the recreational marijuana. And this council is taking its first step, kind of the initiative regarding moratorium. I was just looking back at my notes. Uh, you actually scheduled a public hearing at your September 6th meeting. so. Really, before you know it, uh, this issue will be coming back. The point of that was to really allow the state to take some time and to understand what sort of rules and regulations they'll promulgate, which may help inform what we should do locally. Um, local press, uh, I should say, the, the, the TV stations have been interested in the story, so I just kind of alert you to that. Uh, and it may be a matter that the ordinance committee may want to just talk about, and I'm pleased to help you with that conversation. Uh, with regard to the workshop earlier, I certainly appreciate your attention. I, I guess I apologize somewhat for how disjointed it was. This is a, a complicated uh, set of variables, if you will, and I suppose if there was something good that came from it, uh, there was kind of confirmation what many of you were saying are the same concerns that Karen and Dan before and I had been sharing for a year and a half or two with, with Mr. Grondon, um, and it really got to the point that he, uh, he needed to hear it from others. Um, so um, it remains to be seen where that project goes, but I appreciate your attention to it, and I somewhat apologize for it being disjointed. Uh, and lastly, we did receive good news. Um, you may recall or not, uh, the town is actually part of the Department of Labor's SHAPE program, which basically gives us a free pass. Uh, other organizations, public and private, uh, can get an unannounced Department of Labor visit. Uh, <laughs> checking for workplace safety, and that's not a fun experience. Mm -hmm. We've signed up for this voluntarily, and it basically gives us a free pass during the period. And so we're good again until September 2018. So I really appreciate staff's effort to um, work hard to, to get in their good graces and get a get a jail, get out of jail free card. So thank you. Thank you. Council member comments. Council Chiazzo. Uh, no comments other than June 13th is the school budget vote and the um, bond issue for the fuel station. I highly encourage everybody to go out and express your opinion one way or the other. Uh, hopefully it's um, uh, certainly for the bond issue. I think we've stated our case fairly clearly and straightforward with that, but uh, certainly encourage everybody to get out there and either vote. Uh, when does absentee close, Tody? Uh, tomorrow and then Friday and Monday you have to have a special circumstance in order to vote. Okay, thank you. So so tomorrow's the last day absentee and then after that see you on the 13th. Thank you. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, I think I'd echo the same. Yeah, I hope to see everybody at the polls on the 13th and I just encourage everybody. There's been lots of things written and some sort of different ways of looking at the numbers so just take some time and and you know under, try to understand what's what's in front of you and look forward to having you seen there at the polls thank you councillor uh, st Clair. yes yeah, um i just wanted to mention i know that you guys um got it in your email um june 19th um the fight for books program is going to be taking place um my, our foundation actually got involved with them last year. This year we did it again. We gave, I think we did four or five bikes for it, which is really fun. Um, I know that they're giving away 48, so that's amazing. Um, uh, everyone's invited to come, and all the counselors are invited to come when they present those. It's actually a, r a raffle lottery. 
So every book that a kid reads at the age-appropriate level, they get um, a raffle ticket, and so they give away 48 bikes to 48 kids. And it's really, if you haven't seen it before, it's a really, some of these kids absolutely go nuts. So it really is a, it's a fun thing. It, it'll be the, it, like he says, it'll be the best thing you do all day is to go and see these kids win those bikes. Um, they come complete with the helmet. Um, they're all decked out, so it's very cool. Um, the other thing, um, a couple weeks ago, I got to volunteer um, with Heidi's House, which is um, a daycare center in town, and um, they're nationally accredited for their programs, and it was um, really neat. My daughter actually attends school there, but um, to go in and do it as a volunteer, to see another side of it and see some of the other programs that they offer, um, it's a, it was really fun, and, and um, I got to talk a little bit about the council, and you know, you're never too young to start learning, and um, it was it was a neat experience. So if you're ever looking for an afternoon of something to do, I know they're always looking for volunteers over there. They have a big center, and the kids are just amazing. Um, so that was fun. And um, don't forget, if any of you want to help on Tuesday at the polls, please let me know. And other than that, I am good. Thank you. Councilor Foley? Uh, I would just echo what Councilor Hayes and Councilor Cavo were saying. Um, there has been... Uh, a fair amount. I, I think we've made progress, but there's still a fair amount of uh, discourse in the community around the numbers. And these, this side is lying, and that side is lying. And you know what? We've we've done the best job. We put forth a number unanimously that we uh, all agreed with, and um, we think it's acceptable. And if, if mm -hmm. it's not to you, then the, your opportunity is to to tell us mm -hmm. that at the polls. Uh, most importantly, I want people to vote, but I also want people to be respectful of the different perspectives and approaches that are out there. Um, I don't take uh, offense to anybody who tells me that uh, what we're putting out there is too high. I tell them to exercise their right to vote. So um, just get to the poll. Yeah, yeah, so I would also uh, encourage people to vote. I would say uh, we, that was a uh, a difficult budget to pass, and I think we did a good job of that. I'm encouraging people to pass it. Um, the um, um, there's also, a, I believe, there's a public safety tour on Wednesday. Oh, that yes, yes, thank you. Does someone have the details of that? I just happened to. Sorry, we should have. Peter and I should have. Just yeah. one of us should have grabbed yeah, that. That's right. We do have the details, and we can get it out to you. Okay, but it's six o'clock next Wednesday. Is that when yeah. I understand yeah. public is invited? Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Open house at the at the <laughs> police station. They're going to give a tour. You can go through the building. They're going to actually do a little bit of a presentation about, you know, what what the new building looks like and why. And I think by going through the building, you'll get yeah. a good sense of we'll see why. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, and then I, I uh, also would endorse Heidi Southside to graduates as well. So it's a wonderful facility. Yeah. Hmm. Graduate. Like that. Uh, I think we've all seen the 7.4% uh, increase signs out there uh, and uh, I was appalled by it uh, I think it's a uh, you know it's so disrespectful to the work that was put in by our finance committee and the school's finance committee it so misrepresents uh, what was uh, the result of our budget effort and I've had that I was playing in the none such mentally and said this guy, I didn't know him. He said, oh, it's never going to pass. 7.4% tax increase. I said, that's not it at all. Uh, and for anyone out there, just so you'll know, uh, whether you think it's a cost increase, spending increase year over year, or a tax impact increase year over year, what we have proposed is a town increase of 2.2% of spending from last year. And 3.39% is the school's increase in spending. And the overall, which we can't nail precisely because we have to wait for the August assessment by the assessor, uh, runs from 2.8 uh, up to 4 with a mid-range of 3.49, 3.5%, with my expectation that we'll get money out of Augusta and it'll be closer to 2.8 than it will be to any other number. Uh, and here we have signs put everywhere in town, 7.4% increase. 
it's outrageous. And, and, the, and so I stopped, I read the sign, I got out of my car to see who was, it was attributed to, smart taxes. That's, to me, they're just smart alex. There's, there's, there's no, I don't think you can trust people who would manipulate the public. And this guy on the golf course just said, no, this is never going to pass. I said, really? So that, that bothered me a lot. And seeing the signs all side by side, that, that bothered me a lot. The whole thing, I thought, stunk. Uh, so that's just my own two cents on that. Um, on a much nicer note, uh, the uh, uh, Highland Avenue greenhouse <coughs> I'd like to recognize uh, uh, out on Highland Avenue uh, uh, and reading from the press release. This year's main family business awards drew 166 nominations for recognition, from which seven winners were named. Uh, the event was sponsored by the Institute for Family-Owned Business in Portland. Highland Avenue Greenhouse of Scarborough received the Matty Corson Small Business Award, uh, presented to an exemplary business with fewer than 25 employees. The nearly 70-year-old company was acknowledged for the way it has continued to evolve, adding services that provide value and convenience to customers and adopting new approaches to making its business more environmentally friendly and sustainable, such as switching to biological pest control in the greenhouse and adding a commercial kitchen at its farm stand to produce baked goods, soup sandwiches, uh, and prepared to go meals. And I can personally attest to the chicken pot pie. So I will, I will, I will say that. So c congratulations to Joe and Christine. Uh, 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 I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Visconti is uh, probably the way. And lastly, the Higgins Beach uh, Character Code audit uh, is is advancing. Uh, this Sunday, June 11th, uh, uh, there will be an open house with the uh, people who developed it originally. Uh, for input uh, by people, and it's being held at the Higgins Beach Association Clubhouse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple items. Uh, first, um, I am totally shocked that no one has mentioned this. Graduation is this weekend, so I want to congratulate all of our graduating class, but also thank their parents and the teachers that invested so much in their pathway to this uh, successful milestone. Um, a special uh, congratulations uh, personally to uh, um, no, no, man, I won't say personally, but uh, to every, um, you know when you're getting older, when you remember these little kids that came through the rec program and now they're starting to graduate, and it's just like I'm feeling really old with these graduations, but congratulations to all of them. It's uh, pretty exciting, and good luck as you move on to your next uh, part of your life. Um, also wanted to mention Get Out the Vote. It is June 13th. There are actually three referendum questions. There is our local budget, of course, that I hope you do vote in favor of. It is a well thought out and um, a, a very um, worthwhile investment plan. I did want to mention and, and say thank you to Councillor Hayes and also to uh, the finance chair for the school board, uh, Jody Shea, for um, the very nice letter to the editor um, explaining the process and the collaboration that occurred. I, I really do appreciate um, the tone and the context in which that was written and think that it was truly representative of our community and the work that we've done. So I want to say thank you, Peter, very, very much. I um, did want to mention that on the 13th at polls, um, the poll, there is only one poll. It is actually at Town Hall, and Town Hall opens up at 7 and will close at 8 p.m. I um, also wanted to mention the other two items. Um, I'm not really going to focus on the state because I don't really recall what that was about. It was about basically infrastructure and uh, investment. I think it was $50 million bonds. But um, there is the fuel station uh, referendum question asking um, voter approval for bonding for the replacement of a fu uh, fuel station um, fuselage tank that's underground. Um, it's very, very important. I do hope that the citizens um, pass that um, so that we can resolve that problem before it becomes a bigger problem with EPA or DEPA or any state agency. So uh, do please vote in favor of that as well. Um, also wanted to mention, sorry, I had something else. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about the Maine Family Business Award they mentioned. Um, um, Bill, um, that family I've known for uh, about 20 years. They're absolutely incredible story. It started with uh, Joe's grandfather, Frank Gutter, um, who passed the business down to his daughter, Linda Gutter, and then uh, Joe and his wife took that over. So it shows that small business agriculture can still flourish in Scarborough in a fairly high-density area 
I'm over in the Highland Avenue segment. So, um, and if you go in there, it's just, I remember when all they sold were um, basically plants, replantable plants and Christmas trees. And now they have this wonderful small little store that includes homemade baked goods and all kinds of stuff. And so, um, and a lot of that was really Joe and Christine that really took it to that level. So that is truly, truly exciting uh, for them. And last, I wanted to, first, I, I really wanted to say thank you to the Communications Committee for the continued work. I, get to, I do get feedback around those um, uh, public uh, sessions that you have and, and how successful they, they are. And I do um, want you to know, I, I choose not to attend purposely because I think that it gives one the opportunity for the committee members to really be the leaders within that particular group because that's what we've charged that group for. And sometimes when you have too many counselors in a room, it can make things more complicated. So I try to be respectful of that. Um, working out of town also doesn't necessarily help getting here early. But um, I do want to say thank you because it is working and I think that this has been a very good start. I do want to mention that my door is always open. I publish my personal cell phone. Um, that was the one condition my wife said when I ran for re-election that no one was supposed to call the house. Been very good so far, so my cell phone is published. You're always welcome to call. And the reason why I mention that is that in the past week and a half, I have gone to three different neighborhood uh, sit-downs and coffees to talk about the budget and about the communications that's, come, that's going on around it, and particularly around the signs. And I think that um, without characterizing anyone, I look at it, the signs for what is the intent of the message that's being said on that sign. And I think it's extremely clear that some of those signs are purposely misleading. And that's because they're taking advantage of a very um, hostile community or hostile moment um, in which people are very upset with government across the board up to the federal level, including taxes. Um, so I'm really appreciative of those that do reach out and I'm able to sit down and talk to them to explain to them exactly what is going on um, because it is not what is being presented on those signs and it's not what's being presented in some of their communications on social media. So um, I know that um, all of you, as well as myself, are always open for a conversation around that and so anyone is welcome to give me a call. And with that, um, I would um, have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you.